We're here today with Dionysios Kapsaskis, a senior lecturer in translation at the Department of Media, Culture and Language of the University of Roehampton. Thank you for having us today. Good morning, thank you for having me. So, um, audiovisual translation, what is it, what does it mean and when did it originate? Audiovisual translation is a number of practices um, which are about providing access to media or film audiovisual products that to providing access to people who need access to these products uh, whether it is because they don't speak the language in which these pro uh, audiovisual products are made or because they have some kind of um, uh, a sensory um, lack of access and therefore through audiovisual translation they get access to these products. Mm -hmm. So when did subtitling first appear as a tool to provide accessibility, in this case not sensory but linguistic, to the general public and to specific niche publics? Well, subtitling is a technique that originated in uh, the old days where you had silent cinema. Uh, so from the very early days, subtitling was there in the form of intertitles rather than subtitles. And it had initially a narrative function. So intertitles appeared there in order to guide the narrative and therefore help the viewers understand what was going on um, on screen. But uh, later on, intertitles were also translating or actually um, expressing what uh, the actors were supposed to be saying. Uh, of course, interlingual subtitling developed soon after you had the talkies and therefore we moved on from silent cinema to, uh, to the talkies. And it was one of the techniques that appear, appeared very soon after that transition in 1929 and in immediate competition with dubbing at the time, which also developed uh, soon after. And after that you had a separation, let's say, of national cinemas uh, some of them following the subtitling route, others following the dubbing route, which is a situation that is not absolutely stable, that is, it changes in time. It is not exactly clear what it is down to, what it is, um, how, how this has been formed, but there are some general rules that have to do with the economics of, uh, of subtitling and dubbing, and it's a situation that persists today. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how does the subtitling marketplace and the industry work you have been studying this topic for a number of years. What has been the evolution of this field? Well, I've been studying it and I've been working as a subtitler into Greek for many years and, and I still work with some major prov providers. Uh, this has changed in many ways. Uh, obviously, uh, film being a global medium where you know cinema travels across borders, and we are moving on to a, we are already in a world of in a globalized world so subtitling is one of the major ways for 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 providing accessibility uh, to film uh, so there there have been changes especially going from all ways of broadcasting and f film showing to you know to, to digital ways of, of broadcasting and showing film and subtitling especially becomes more and more popular uh, in the new kind of digital era because it is cheaper basically and because it's much more instant than other ways of linguistic accessibility um, i would say that um, the main um, ways of providing uh, subtitles if we leave aside the technical side of it and we look at the subtitles themselves has, has not dramatically changed so you don't have big changes in terms of how subtitles look like the, their form uh, if we compare for instance the 50s and today there are minor changes in terms of um, you know um, people becoming perhaps more literate uh, so there is more literacy, that's what I mean, and therefore um, they are able to read perhaps faster, so there is more text on screen than it used to be, but essentially the basic form of, subtitling re re of subtitles remains the same. And has the creativity of the technique changed thanks to technology or to perhaps the uh, receiving end? So this is where the big change um, has occurred in terms of the processes that take place in order to produce 
subtitles. Uh, I suppose that the main change that has occurred through the years is that whereas in the old days the authorship of the subtitles and the creation of the subtitles takes, took place, used to take place locally, that is, the original film was produced in what we can call the cultural center of production, call it Hollywood for instance, and then the film itself, it would travel to the local place of its showing and then the subtitles would then be produced locally in that place. Uh, this is no longer the case, at least as far as important cultural products are concerned. So let's say major Hollywood films, but also less major uh, films. So films that have uh, international circulation. The subtitling of these films uh, these days happens, one would tend to say centrally, uh, in the sense that it is definitely managed and guided by big subtitling um, authorship uh, companies. Um, but it is even more complicated th than that because the subtitlers can actually be anywhere in the world. Uh, definitely, there is no necessity that they should be at the place where the subtitles are meant to be shown. Uh, so you can be anywhere in the world, subtitle for a company that is usually located centrally, let's say London or Los Angeles or even India, or be a multilingual company that is all over the world. And then your subtitles uh, in your language will be managed together with subtitles in other languages based on a so-called template file, which is created in English for each individual film and then um, that will be part of a DVD or that will be part of a product that will then travel and be shown locally. Then uh, the conclusion is that the process itself has become more streamlined, but does it pay attention to a difference, for example, to deaf viewers, hard of hearing viewers? Uh, the subtitling, the interlingual subtitling is of course a different process from the process of, uh, you know, the um, the, the heart of hearing uh, audiences. These are two distinct, um, let's say, um, processes, even if they meet uh, at some parts. So if I am to become a bit more detailed in terms of how the process happens, if you have, let's say, an audiovisual product, let's say a film, for instance, then uh, as far as subtitling is concerned, we are already at the stage of post-production. And at that stage, uh, the film will go, uh, will be digitized, obviously, or if it is already digital, and it will go to in the hands of someone who is normally a, a native English speaker, and they will produce, at that stage, a set of subtitles which will be identical to um, interlingual subtitles, but they will be in English. And so this is the so-called template file that every other uh, subtitler or translator are going to use in order to pr produce different versions of that, of, that, um, of that film in various languages and also for the hard of hearing. So from the moment that this template file is, is created, each of the subtitlers or translators will work separately, always referring to a central project manager and then they will uh, create their own uh, local versions of that file based on the template file. It is true that when you work with a company as a local subtitler, they will ask you not to translate the template file, but to translate the dialogue as you hear it. Uh, but it is also true, and I've myself have uh, done some research, which I have published on the use of template files, it is also true that uh, subtitlers tend to simply translate from the, from the template file. And therefore, if you uh, imagine that there is an error in the template file, uh, then the error is reproduced. If there is a norm, specific norm in the template file, I uh, just to remind the template file is the English file, uh, the English subtitles of an English film. So if there is a norm, therefore, for instance, if it is, if there is a tendency to tone down the swearing in the uh, template file, then the swearing will be toned down also in the local subtitles, the local languages. Or if there is a simple translation uh, decision, strategic decision to reduce the text in this or that way, that decision will be reproduced in the local versions to a great extent. 
Uh, now, of course, subtitlers, uh, interlingual subtitlers, we tend to be creative people. We have started from some kind of creative uh, background in our minds. We have studied languages, we've, we like art, we like literature. This is the kind of people we are, uh, most of us anyway. And that means that we want to preserve that kind of um, the ability to make creative decisions and authorial decisions uh, when we create our subtitles. So you will see obvi obviously uh, var variation and you will see um, intelligence in the way subtitles are being used and you will see also artful artfulness, personal aesthetics, this is there. But when we think of subtitling in terms of how it works professionally in a work that works towards the principle of, you know, um, economies of scale, and if you also think that the rates are not very high in subtitling, and if you think that this is then a job for subtitlers who have to work uh, not only for money and for you know for, for their own income but also they have to work with very the very very strict rules of uh, professional conventional subtitling that are there and i mean by that um, number of characters fonts and all that uh, then it's uh, you can see that subtitlers simply sometimes get tired and they just translate from the template file and that's uh, the problem with, uh, you know, what you mentioned before, the lack of difference, the lack of variety. Um, I'm less of an expert in with hard of hearing subtitles, I have to say, so I'm not sure if I'm able to, to answer that part of the question. Right, so do conventions exist, do standards, norms, are these applied, and uh, what's more, uh, does uh, a space exist to transcend this norm or perhaps to deviate from this norm and create something different rather than something that is homogeneous? The question of homogeneity is there uh, for sure. Uh, the question of um, conventions in subtitling, uh, it has been analysed most uh, pertinently and forcefully by Abe Mark Norns. He is the main, mm, let's say, writer who has professed himself very forcefully against um, the strong presence of professional norms in subtitling, and there have been some recent, uh, there has been some recent research, which has looked as to has looked into the necessity of these norms. Why are they there in the first place? Is it true, for instance, that um, people cannot read faster than 180 words per minute? Is it true that we need to normalize the translation in order for um, to prioritize the meaning as opposed to other um, aspects of translations, for instance, the register. Um, all these, you know, which you also teach to our students because this is what the market expects of them, um, it has, they have not been necessarily proven. There is a very strong tradition uh, because subtitling already, you know, is, is more than a century old as a practice, uh, more than 100 years old. And um, so there is a, lot, a very strong tradition as to how subtitles should, uh, should be conducted, but I'm not sure that the evidence is there that it should be conducted the way it is. This is proven these days, not necessarily proven, but um, let's say that this certainty that subtitling should be conducted the way it is professionally, uh, this certainty has been shaken through practices of fun subbing, to begin with, but also creative subtitling, which is something that also is happening today due to all the affordances of technology. Uh, creative subtitling meaning adding colors, uh, play, being more playful with the lines, with the position of the subtitles, with the fonts, expressing emotion, expressing various effects that are there in the film, uh, providing a more immersive experience through the subtitles. So I'm not sure if I answered the question. I think so. What do yeah. you think will be the future of subtitling from the didactic point of view and also from the technological and market-based point of view? From Well, there are so many things that um, are changing in subtitling. Um, I'll mention the didactic part later. Uh, what I would like to mention now is that the big changing that is probably happening in subtitling and it's down to the fact that there is so much, let's say, there's such a, mm, 
there are such big, so big budgets in film and audiovisual media, because subtitling is perhaps not mainly about film anymore, it's about audiovisual media. Volunteer subtitling or other ways of participatory subtitling is happening to such scale these days that companies are becoming aware that they can do subtitling for less money, as far as they are concerned. And they are also investing at uh, machine translation of, sub of, of dialogue, film dialogue into, into subtitles. So that's perhaps the biggest change that is going to happen in the, in the, in the future. Maybe not the so distant future. That is that com um, companies will look for further economies of scale. Um, there may not be awareness that uh, creativity in subtitles is something positive. And therefore, we may fa be facing a situation where, um, you know, the informed approaches to subtitling that we are inculcating to our students may not be necessarily relevant from an economic and a market perspective in the future. Um, we don't know, of course, how things are going to go. But the biggest change that I see happening is more mechanized, mechanized approaches to, to subtitling and the willingness to use subtitle, subtitler, subtitling work um, in less kind of defined um, contexts in terms of people's contracts and, and livelihoods. So that's the one thing. In terms of didactics of subtitling, obviously this is a topic that um, a lot of uh, young people find very, very interesting. And there is a reason for that, I think, because as I mentioned before, we have moved in a more globalized world, but at the same time we have moved in a world that becomes much more, I would say, visually relevant and more aesthetically kind of rich than it's uh, than it than, than it was in for the best part of the 20th century and therefore image the moving image and the information that comes with the image and other aesthetic goods uh, is very very um, is, is keenly felt by the young people. They understand the power of the image and the power of the combination between image and language. And therefore, subtitling has become one of the hot topics because as I, it takes a specific make, a mental kind of formation to, to, for, for someone to be a subtitler. And a lot of young people have it. You know, they like languages, they like cultures, they like images, they like um, all this effect that comes with the moving image. And they also, uh, because we live in that global world, they have an, an intercultural understanding of the world and an, an intercultural sensitivity that comes with that, which was not very, um, it was not so generalized in the previous centuries. It's, it's kind of a new thing. And therefore, that's why many students are interested in audiovisual translation. Now, of course, we understand and appreciate that. So when they come to places like Roehampton in order to study and to um, uh, and to get their degrees in translation and audiovisual translation at po postgraduate level, we teach them um, all the techniques of subtitling, we'll teach them theories of subtitling. One particular recent development that we work on here uh, in my university is uh, we help them to understand film um, from a subtitling perspective. So help them to understand the various, the different rhythms of film, the rhythm, the rhythm of speaking, the rhythms of the image, and also to have a better understanding of the reading rhythm uh, of, the, of, the, of the audience, or rhythms, because there are many reading rhythms. And so there's a kind of particular understanding of film that we're trying to, um, to pass on to them in order for them to become, uh, you know, good subtitlers. And um, uh, so, I think moving on from there, uh, we teach them, we encourage them to be more creative in terms of subtitling. We encourage them to be more, to appreciate the importance of uh, going beyond the limits that we ourselves teach them as well. Uh, perhaps what can be mentioned at this point is that um, thinking about subtitling as such um, is, is, is actually not possible. When you think of subtitling, you have to contextualize it in a more general um, framework of translating the image. Uh, and translating the image is also translating, you know, um, what you see, translating the, the colors, translating the forms, translating 
um, so producing basically a translated product that replaces the original product. Uh, the idea, therefore, that a subtitled film, for instance, is not the same as the original film. And so basically, when we teach them about subtitling, we teach them about that kind of um, idea of, let's say, visual translation, translating not just a film, but uh, translating advertisement, translating uh, exhibitions, translating um, various ways of blogs, for instance, of, of, of you know, visually uh, rich um, content. Dr. Dionysius Kapsaskis, thank you very much. Thank you.